Hello and welcome to The Reasons I'm Broke. I'm Daniel. And I'm Kelly. And this episode, number 70, has been brought to you by Mega Convention, Megacon. You can get your tickets at megaconvention.com. Great guest this year, one of the largest, if not the largest, comic book anime convention in all of Florida. Mm -hmm. They also have sci-fi. There's something for everybody there. So definitely check it out. It is a great, awesome weekend. We'll touch some more on uh, Megacon later on today. But for any first-time listeners, we cover any news, video game, comics, TV, movies, and then we eventually head over to the comic books in which we go over Kelly and I's pull list for the week. Mm -hmm. We're going to have our picks and passes of the week and any thoughts that we had on the rest of the comics that we picked up. But first, like Daniel said, we're going to start out with news. Nintendo has canceled the NES Remix contest, to which there was no prize to, because gamers had found an exploit to it. The gamer with the best time got public recognition from Nintendo, but gamers discovered that if you pause the game repeatedly, you could slow down the game's time. So this is another example of Nintendo just wanting everyone to have fun with the contest, but then if there were cheaters or an exploit to it, it was all gone. Even if there was no prize or contest or anything, they said... This is over. It's done. You guys couldn't handle this. You're all children. <laughs> so is that Nintendo's fault for leaving the exploit there? Or is it the gamers or nobody's? It's the gamers because they're like, oh, I'm just going to keep pausing so I win. There's no prize, but I'm going to win. I'm like, sir, you're taking away from that little kid who's played this 14 times in the last hour just to try and beat that score. Well, the counter argument is that Nintendo canceling the contest, they now just slided all of the people that were legitimately trying to get the best scores and trying to play the game but right. But now do you know who was who really got the best scores? You don't. So I could sit here and say, man, I got a really good score. I don't know if I beat Jimmy over there because Jimmy could have been exploiting. Yeah, I guess so. But So that's why the NES Remix contest is down. On to some Sony news. This is actually pretty important here. At CES 2014, Sony has announced PlayStation Now. It is a streaming service where you'll be able to stream games from as far back as the PlayStation 1 for a service fee. This service will be accessible in the summer through PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3, PlayStation Vita, certain Bravia TVs, and even other Android devices. That's awesome. That's a really smart idea. Do you know how much money they're going to make off that? Remember back when the PS4 got announced and they said it was not going to be backwards compatible? Mm -hmm. And I said they would find a way to make you pay to pay, play your old games? Yeah. That's it, right there. I, I would pay to play old games. Yeah, what are you going to charge me? 20 bucks a month? Sure. Unlimited games? They're going to charge way more than 20 <laughs> No, come on, Dad. Just let me dream for a little bit. It is pretty awesome to be able to play any of those old games. They're not saying that they're going to add all of them. It's probably going to be like the PlayStation to Store is now, where certain games get added every week, and then you'll be able to stream them as you go. The problem with PlayStation Now, and that's the one I'm seeing, at least here in the U.S., somewhere like Europe, they, this probably won't be an issue, but the internet speeds. How mm -hmm. are you going to stream a game? Like, we can stream movies and TV shows, but even then, sometimes it does lag, and you do have some trouble with that. They're going to have to implement some kind of system so that it actually works out here in the U.S., where we do have slower internet servers as compared to, say, Europe. They will find a way. They're going to get our money, whatever it takes, Dan. Yeah, GameStop everywhere is going, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. The stocks just dropped. <laughs> On to some comic book news. Amazing Spider-Man number one has been posted by BleedingCool.com. Spoiler alert, Peter Parker is returning. Because nobody guessed that it was going to happen. <laughs> Damon Wayne, however, will stay dead. <laughs> no, he's coming back. <laughs> yeah, of course. It will be confirmed in the upcoming Superior Spider-Man. So there you go. Almost a year later, mm -hmm. after Doc Ock took over Spider-Man, Peter Parker's already coming back. Dan Slott was saying that from the beginning, this was one of the more difficult decisions for him to do, to kill off Peter Parker for the story, which was Doc Ock. He knew later on he was going to bring Peter Parker back, of course. He wanted to tell this story, which eventually leads to the return of Peter Parker. But he said it was also difficult, not only because he likes Spider-Man and Peter Parker so much, but because of the fans. I mean, if you remember, we talked so endlessly about the death threats that he was getting. Yeah. And all the awful Twitter messages that he would just retweet and then block people. And right now, he's getting more of that. If you look at his Twitter, now people are saying, you don't really like Spider-Man. You're just bringing this back because of the complaints. Fuck you, guy. You think you're like... The reason that Spider-Man Peter Parker is coming back, your little 140 character tweet is really what brought Peter Parker back. You don't think Dan Slott has these stories already planned out ahead of time, years in advance? You're an idiot. <laughs> People, they're fictional characters. Calm down. 
<laughs> so we should write to Dan Slott and um, demand that Doc Ock stay as Spider-Man or else threaten him. Demand that Spider-Man... No. Demand that Batman takes over for Spider-Man. <laughs> and then when it happens, then our tweet did something. <laughs> <laughs> the crossover we've been waiting for. <laughs> Previously leaked, but now officially confirmed, Sinestro will be getting his own ongoing series in April. Woohoo! We talked about this months ago, but now DC has officially shown the cover and talked about it. It will be written by Colin Bunn with art by Dale Eaglesham. I am concerned. A lot of people are. Go ahead with your concerns. Well, if Sinestro's not in the right hands, then it's going to be ruined. Yeah, it's one of the characters that could easily fall into that Jack Sparrow type of thing or mm. the Deadpool thing where they're really good if they're behind the scenes or kind of well, working around the main character in the story. But then when you get a lot of him, that's where it doesn't work out. And this could happen with Sinestro. Mm -hmm. At least we know he can't be killed off. He will become a Green Lantern later in life. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And to be fair, ever since the New 52 started, Green Lantern has been about sinestro so really he's had his own ongoing right right <laughs> sinestro and friends <laughs> kind of like batman it's not the justice league it's batman and colleagues <laughs> yes batman and his bitches <laughs> <laughs> well i am looking forward to it even though i'm concerned so we'll definitely pick it up as soon as it comes out and let you guys know what we think yeah it's the same artist from sinestro number one from villain month mm -hmm. and uh, i thought it was drawn really well mm -hmm. i'm excited for this the cover looks great it's uh, Sinestro's clothing, like, melting off of him, revealing... <gasps> Naked Sinestro? <laughs> no, the Sinestro uh -huh. core outfit underneath. <laughs> Naked Sinestro. Should have been... Na There's going to be tons of Naked Sinestro jokes now. Just tons. All over the place. The whole book is just going to be Naked Sinestro. <laughs> Remember that time I did actually find Sinestro yes! naked? <laughs> it was amazing! If you want to see Sinestro naked, it's in the Sinestro core trade paperback. <laughs> like, the first page. You open it. <laughs> naked Sinestro. It's perfect. So yeah, I'm really excited about the Sinestro book as well. Of course, most of everyone reacts negatively to it, but wait till you read it. You never, you haven't read it ahead of time, so no need to get so upset by it. Check out the first act. And like we said in the beginning, this week's podcast is brought to you by Megacon 2014, and they have recently added some new guests. Yeah, a really big one especially. You can get your tickets at megaconvention.com. First guest, John Barrowman. He's most recently worked on the CW's Arrow as Malcolm Merlin, he has also played Captain Jack Harkness in Torchwood and Jeremy in Zero Dark Thirty. I thought you were going to say Captain Jack Sparrow, and I'm like, wait, no, I know who plays him. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fangirl coming out in me. But yeah, Torchwood, that'll bring in a lot of uh, convention goers. Mm -hmm. Also, really big name as well, we have Ron Perlman, who will be there Saturday and Sunday only. He won a Golden Globe for his pastoral as Vincent in Beauty and the Beast. He's also known to many as Hellboy in the Hellboy movies, but to us as Slade Wilson from the animated Teen Titans show. To all the Slade Wilsonettes out there, <laughs> they all freaked out. <laughs> Especially one of our followers, Wolf Queen, mm -hmm. loves Slade Wilson. Slade Wilsonettes are going to be paying money right up the ass to get this guy to sign <laughs> and take pictures with him. Well, he was Vincent Beauty and the Beast. He was a pretty handsome guy. I wonder, yeah, I hope some people bring him the Beauty and the Beast, something Beauty and the Beast to sign. I think we should. Let's, yeah. <laughs> let's bring it from the Disney movie. Be like, this was you, right? <laughs> same thing, right? <laughs> Absolutely the same thing. That's an excellent guest, Ron Perlman. This is exactly what I was talking about with Megacon. We talked about it last week. They have excellent guests. These guests that you will not find at just any other convention. They have the widest range of TV, comics, movies. But then they get the best of each, which is awesome. Ron Perlman, we hadn't seen him. We've never met him. Mm -mm. And I don't think we've gone to a convention where he was there. Great. So now we have the opportunity to meet him and the opportunity to get something Teen Titans signed. Do you have anything Teen Titans? DVD? Oh, I'm sure I do fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sign this Slade Robin fan What would they call it? S Robin or... S Raid? I don't know. I don't <laughs> even know. always give them those names, like yeah. those crossover names. Like Snermione for Snape and Hermione. Zutara for yeah. Zuko and Katara. Yeah. But yeah, again, Megacon 2014. It's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. Again, great guest, Ron Perlman. Make sure to check it out. Again, you can get your tickets at megaconvention.com. That's in March. And there's definitely a benefit to picking up your tickets early online. You get a discounted rate. 
as opposed to at the door. Absolutely. Always save as much money as you can so you can buy more at a convention. Because <laughs> you will buy a lot. <laughs> yeah, if you say you're going to have like a budget of, I don't know, $100. Add 300 more to that. <laughs> Because I do that every time I walk around. I'm like, okay, I'm probably not going to find anything else. This comic is great. I've been looking for it. Sold. Oh, shit. This guy's here. Oh, damn it. <laughs> this, this is what happens. I ask him, how much do you want me to take out of the bank for this? And he gives me a number. And then I say, okay, I'm going to take out this much. And it's always like three times that number that he gives me. And then he ends up taking my money, too. <laughs> I don't See, take it. I'm, you offer I it. I do. I offer You're it. always like, I'm not going to buy anything else, Dan. And I never buy anything else, but you do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this guy's here. Let me go find the comic that he also wrote because... And buy that so that he can sign it too. <laughs> I left mine at home and I can't just go home and get it. And then let me CGC this too while I'm here. I mean, CG's here. Might as well. What else is expensive? <laughs> <laughs> let me buy the convention. <laughs> Again, megaconvention.com. Now we can move on to comics for this week. Mm -hmm. First up, we have some indie books. Adventure Time Flipside, number one of six. This is written by Paul Tobin and Colleen Coover with art by Wook Jin Clark. You really like this one. I think it's a better start to the mm -hmm. offshoot Adventure Time series than the one that was caped... Uh, Candy Capers. Yeah, this was really, really good. I love the art in it, too. It's very different from what we've seen in the other... Uh, it kind of reminded me of the art that we see in the specials that they do, where they have all the different artists. Right. But I'm assuming this artist is actually on it for the whole six-issue miniseries. Yeah, if you want to explain real quick uh, the plot on the Adventure Time flip side, essentially they're trying to go on an adventure, but <laughs> they end up eating ice cream along the way. Like, the tasks that they're given <laughs> they're are so cool. incredibly simple, but they overcome them. So it is an adventure in Adventure Time, whereas normally there's some kind of plot involved with a character. This is solely focusing on Finn and Jake trying to take on the biggest, most difficult adventure there is. Yep. And I think one of my favorite parts, because they have to get it, an adventuring license. These two bullies are like, do you have a license for adventuring? And they're like, oh, no. So they have to carry, they're called gossip bulls up mm -hmm. the <laughs> stairs. And there are these two male bulls just talking about Jimmy and what he did last week. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, but anyway, we get to the end and they're trying to save Portrait Princess from an evil wizard who kidnapped her. And they get there and Portrait Princess is like, no, I need you to convince the wizard to kidnap me. And that's going to be the plot of this. And Bubblegum's involved somehow. I don't know right. how. Bubblegum's always involved. <laughs> because she's awesome. She's Starfire too. She is. It's true. Next one in the indie books is Sex Criminals number four. It's written by Matt Fraction and art by Chip Zdarsky. I'm still loving this story. I really am. We get the introduction. If you remember in the last one, the police show up when they're in the quiet. Right. And that lady's pretty freaky. Yeah, she we was. We find out she's a soccer mom. <laughs> yeah, they're all like regular people. <laughs> but the basic plot of this, and we figured this out at this point is that they're trying to raise money for this library and they're actually going through with it. We're going backwards and actually seeing how they came up to this idea and how they're actually carrying out their crime of taking from banks in which they're, they justify it by saying it's not really a lot considering how much banks make. Mm -hmm. I think they said it was like a year's worth of like those office pens or the... Yeah, yeah something exactly. like that. And that they're like, this money will go towards a good cause. So really, we're actually doing a service. But, of course, they have the sex police, I guess, and <laughs> they want to stop them. Who show up. I want to know how they all end up in that world. Yeah, Do, do all too. the police just, like, have sex with each other? And then say, yeah, I don't She's know. a soccer mom. Why is she with that burly guy who drives trucks? Because they're police people. <laughs> we, no, that's no excuse. I also like the letters at the very end of the comic book. I don't know if you've read those, mm -mm. but it's, like, two or three pages of just letters from a lot of fans talking about like their sexual experiences <laughs> with the authors with the author and the authors just responding to all of them it's really funny i should read them that sounds yeah, really good they're good on to marvel mm -hmm. we have cataclysm ultimate spider-man number three of three this is written by brian michael bendis with art by david marquez yeah the final ultimate spider-man book assuming that there's not another Ultimate Spider-Man book in the works in the main 616 universe for Marvel. But here we have the confrontation between Miles and his dad, his dad who hates mutants. His dad is a dick. His dad was a dick. Just throwing that out there. 
how mature was Miles in this issue to not get upset at his dad? Amazing. And just be like, I, I was so impressed. You're regret. You're gonna regret what you're saying right now, and I'll forgive you for it. That's fine. But right now, we need to save your ass. Mm-hmm. It was that's a Spider-Man thing to do. It just gives. This is why I like the character so much, Miles, and this is why I really want him to continue in the Six One Six universe. He's so likable. He's we're finding out he's mature. He is responsible. He doesn't care about the people knowing his identity he just wants to help people and that's very reminiscent of the ultimate peter parker that passed away Mm -hmm. yep it was a great issue um like we said his dad was a total dick you'd have to read it to understand but why don't you hop over to marvel.com and you can read it for yourself absolutely uh one of this week's digital comics again brought to you by megacon marvel.com slash redeem the following code to the first person that heads over there T M A 6 3 U 0 J S L E 3. You do realize the first person who listens to this podcast gets like all the giveaways. <laughs> <laughs> they do, but the second one we'll actually do over Twitter. That's for the next comic that we're actually going to cover here. It's Cataclysm Ultimate's Last Stand, number three of five. It's written by Brian Michael Bendis with art by Mark Bagley. Love Mark Bagley. Mm hmm. This one was really touching for me, too, with Mr. Fantastic. We see this world's Mr. Fantastic and Miles, Spider-Man, go into the other universe to figure out how they're going to stop giant Galactus Man eating stuff. And Mr. Fantastic sees what could have been if he didn't decide to be evil. Right. That was a great moment. Oh, man. And it's so sad. Mm -hmm. Because the whole time I'm expecting Ultimate Mr. Fantastic to turn on miles and just Mm -hmm. stay in that 616 universe and let everyone else die not the case he sees again like you said what could have been goes back to his world and says something along the lines of i apologize for not realizing until now just how beautiful the world is yeah (laughs) chills i melted went into shibalba and (laughs) enlightenment It was a great, that was probably my favorite part of the book. Mm-hmm. It was. It was a very great issue. I definitely recommend it. I think, oh, between the two, which one did you like better? They were, uh, I'm going to have to go with the Ultimate's Last Stand. Really? I think mm-hmm. mine was Ultimate Spider-Man. Yeah, but both great pickups. Like that tie-in, that's exactly how you should do a tie-in, like mm-hmm. a Cataclysm. Like it, something happened here, you expand it on the characters, not just the main one, but the ones around them. Even though they probably won't survive this Galactus But it's nice to see that even they are learning and growing and experiencing something different. And now you're going to be sad when they die. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Character development and loss. That's how you do it. But for Cladiclism Ultimate Last Stand number three, we will have that code up on Twitter. For the first person who heads over there, picks it up. You can read it online, marvel.com slash redeem. On to some DC Comics. Woo! Batman Black and White number five of six. Whole lot of writers and artists, so hang with me for just a moment. We have Ivan Brandon, Keith Giffen, Blair Butler, Lynn Wayne, and Jimmy Palmiotti for writers. And for your artist, you have Paolo Rivera, Javier Polito, Chris Weston, Victor Ibanez Ramirez, and Andrew Robinson. Yeah, we've got f- five stories in this Batman Black and White. It's our first of compilation book that we got this week. Mm-hmm one of which will be Detective Comics. Again, talk about it later. But Batman Black and White, it's been really interesting because every single story is different. None of them are the same. And each one, obviously out of continuity, so you can have characters die or you can even have Batman die if you really wanted to. But the first one was called Hell Knight. This is the one written by Ivan Brandon. This is basically Batman dealing with pain and dealing with a test that he sets up. I'm not going to spoil the ending to it. It was so cool. But it's it's it would it exactly tells you how Batman prepares for the worst. And when people are like, "How did Batman get out of this?" This is why, because of this kind of training. This kind of crazy shit, man. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's definitely out of his mind. Yes, it was good. It was. It was great. The next one is called Cat and Mouse. It's written by Keith Giffen with art by Javier Pulido. This one's really cool too. It takes place in a bar and some stinky man runs in. Let's just call him Stinky Man. I don't remember mm-hmm. his name. And he's like, oh man, the fucking bat was chasing me and I ran away and he's everywhere. And really funny. I can definitely feel the friendship between these four characters mm-hmm. that we have sitting at the bar. Yeah. And I guess they had committed a crime and they're talking about it. And nobody's ever going to find out. And then we get a classic Batman moment at the end. Very similar to uh, Almost, Almost Got, got him. him. Yeah. Yeah. 
it was great. But these guys were written so well. One of my favorite parts, they're talking about the donut girl Mm -hmm. at the donut shop. And one of his friends offhandedly comments, she thinks you're an idiot. And for four panels, you have this one friend trying to interrupt them all. Like, she thinks I'm an idiot? She doesn't (laughs) think I'm an idiot. I'm going to have to go have a talk with her. (laughs) (laughs) It was pretty good. The next one was actually, I think, my favorite out of the entire series or the the entire book. It's called I Killed the Bat. It's written by Blair Butler, illustrated and lettered by Chris Weston. This is the one. It is a murder story from an artist, though. It's by an artist and someone murdering another artist. And just the way this whole thing is carried out and then the final page or the final reveal, it makes the whole story. It's really eerie. Yeah, it was a really good one. This truly puts you in the mind of an Arkham inmate. And you see, it's as clear as day. You can see why they lost their minds, why they did what they did, and how they kind of play it out in their head and how they sometimes even recreate this. Like, that is a Batman Arkham inmate villain. Like, that's exactly their process. And you see it in the short story. Mm -hmm. It it was the shortest of all of them, I think. Mm -hmm. It, It was very short, but definitely amazing. Next one is called Flipside. It's written by Lynn Ween with art by Victor Ibanez. It is a two-faced story involving Nightwing. Very well illustrated Robin. again. Yeah, Robin. Should call him Robin. <laughs> um, it didn't uh, blow me away. Maybe by the ending because I'm like, oh, okay, so here's... The ending was great. Yeah. It's We'll spoil it because it wasn't right. amazing. But it's Two-Face is going to go rob something. So Nightwing shows up to stop him. He's in like a little armored car and stops him. And then he goes wait a second and then pulls off two faces face and you're like oh no he did all this for nothing then we cut to the bank where the real two faces and he's opening up the vault he's gonna take him some money (laughs) there's batman like just waiting patiently (laughs) he's like i've been waiting for you (laughs) you're a few minutes late I was like, fucking Batman, bitch. Got your ass. <laughs> he probably just told Nightwing, Nightwing, go do this. Do my bitch work. I'm going to go find the real Two-Face. Because if Batman, had, Batman wouldn't have fallen for that. But if he did, he somehow would have still made it back to the safe <laughs> before Two-Face got yeah, there. Yeah, he would have. He's Batman. And the final story is called Hope. This one's written by Jimmy Palmiotti, who's, of course, working on the Harley Quinn book that mm-hmm. we're picking up. Also works on All-Star Western this for me was a very touching story it it symbolizes what i think batman and bruce wayne is together in a way we don't see in a lot of stories we see it occasionally where batman can then use his bruce wayne persona to help people right Um, and that's what we get to see in this one but it's essentially batman is hunting down somebody follows a criminal to a food bank comes in dressed as bruce wayne well not Comes in as Bruce Wayne, but he's dressed like a hobo bum and finds out that the only reason this guy is helping the mob boss is to save his father. Mm -hmm. He's in a bind and if he wants his dad to live, he needs to come up with money fast. Right. And that's what the kind of thing that Batman does do. As Bruce Wayne, if someone is a criminal and you saw that in the animated series, he will give them a job at, for example, Wayne Enterprises or he'll find a way to... A scholarship. Yeah, a scholarship, exactly. And that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that Batman is Batman even outside the suit. And he will, you know, do what is right and help out people that are not as fortunate as he is. Mm -hmm. So that was Batman Black and White number five. Um, Overall, it was good. Not my favorite this week, though. Not as good as the Dustin Wynn. Yeah, the Dustin Wynn story. (laughs) (laughs) Next is the... Superman Loves Batman book. (laughs) Number seven. (laughs) (laughs) That's what we're renaming Batman Superman. Superman Loves Batman. It's the final piece of this horizontal story with the video game people. Yeah, weird. Written by Greg Pak, art by Brett Booth, and Norm Rapmond. A lot of gay Superman moments in this one. Of course. A lot. Superman Loves Batman. Exactly. They kind of do like a video game cheat thing with their bodies because they're connected to the internet. It's it's a weird story still. Like Superman would do anything with his body for Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite. Okay, Superman loves Batman theme song. My 
favorite Superman Loves Batman moment in this issue was when he's like, I accept it all. I just want to be with you. Like, he figured out that the way to be as powerful as Batman and to get those superpowers is to die, but then the video game brings you back with powers. He had to lose in the game, so when he lost, then they could control him as a character, and then they all decided to team up and fight The main villain, right. Mm -hmm. And But just that, the way he does it, and the way he says it in, like, I'm joining you. And there's just this panel of him, like light behind them and batman like reaching out for him or whatever i can lift you up (laughs) which did happen at one point he lifted batman up should have been princess style but he lifted him (laughs) up and he's like knock it off bruce we need to stop (laughs) we need to work together (laughs) with one another i think my favorite gay superman moment was when Batman's being logical about this shit. He's like, you need to go destroy that computer. And he's like, I, I can't. It's the only thing keeping you here with me. <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> and Batman, being Batman, he's like, I don't care. Destroy the computer. Don't worry about me. And he shouldn't worry about him because it's fucking Batman. Batman would have Batmaned his way through death. He would have come back. <laughs> he's done it before in like, Return of Bruce yes. Wayne. <laughs> that was a weird story. How do you come back? Well, Darkseid actually put him back in time instead of killing him. Oh, so he batman his way back. Okay, I get it. <laughs> After he became a pirate. Was that our favorite one? Yeah, the pirate Batman. <laughs> <laughs> with his big old scruffy beard. Woolly beard, He yeah. slept with, like, ladies all... He's probably his own grandfather somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> probably. So it's finally over this arc, and we're going to get the return of Jay Lee for the next awesome. uh, couple of issues, which Good. is great. Love Jay Lee. Uh, it was an okay arc. This last one, I wasn't too impressed with it. I loved all the gay Superman moments. That's the reason you picked this book up, if anything, just for that. And now for Jay Lee's artwork. Next, we have one we've really been excited for, Detective Comics number 27. We're going to go story by story on this one and read off the authors and artists for this book. Originally, Paul Dini and Dustin Wynn were supposed to be credited. Man! If you go to DC Comics, they're still listed. Paul Dini, Dustin Wynn, and there's no... Deanie Wynn story in this. <laughs> Deanie Wynn? Is that Deanie what you call it? Yeah. If they had a child, could they name her Deanie Wynn? They absolutely can. Because that sounds... It's great would be the greatest name. writer and artist. <laughs> <laughs> the first story was called The Case of the Chemical Syndicate. It's written by Brad Meltzer, art by Brian Hitch. This was probably my least favorite of the stories. I agree. It was very... Eh. Like a retelling of the origin of Joker, but it's more like, who cares? I don't care. There was nothing interesting about that origin. Um, I guess the best part was Batman escaping a death trap in which he he can't get out of the trap, so he just kicks his way out <laughs> with his Batman strength. And th- then you have the creation of the Joker. I mean, that's basically it. <sighs> yeah. The next one's called Old School. It's written by Greg Hurwitz with art by Neil Adams. Neil Adams kicks yeah. ass in this. No, this one was really, really good. Um, I felt most of these stories as a whole, with the exception of the first one, kind of tell why Batman is who he is. Mm-hmm. They tell us this is who Batman is. And this one does a great job. It Throughout the story, he's transforming. So he's putting on his different costumes. He's changing as he did throughout all the years. Yeah, throughout the 75 years and of And it was Batman. so great. So he starts out real campy, and then halfway through, he gets really dark, and it was great. Yeah, the so way the, the costumes would peel off his skin. Like, Neil Adams, again, knocked it out of the park with this issue. Probably the best uh, art in the book of Detective Comics number 27. And for those of you that don't know why this issue is important or why it's special is because Detective Comics number 27 marks the first appearance of Batman. So when they got to this number again after they relaunched it, they made it into a special issue with all Aww. kinds of creators. Unfortunately, no Paul Dini. Or but Dustin has, Wynn. Or Dustin Wynn. Thank you. But different uh, covers as well, uh, one of which has the first appearance of this owl man person that we don't know who it is yet, the identity. Another cover is the Frank Miller one, <laughs> which is the one our comic book shop had the most of. And from what I'm seeing on Twitter, most comic book shops, that's what they were left with or what that's what they order the most of seeing as how controversial the cover was, or just Frank Miller, because Frank Miller sells based on the name alone. So Mm -hmm. there you go. We ended up getting the Greg Capullo cover. Yes. Which is pretty good. Really nice cover. I would have been fine also with the Frank Miller one. Like, who cares? (laughs) (laughs) But Dan, it's Naked Catwoman. (laughs) Oh, no. My sensitive mind. (laughs) (laughs) But this other one is called Better Days, which was really awesome also. It's uh, Jump Into the Future in the New 52, I guess. I don't know if it's really in continuity or not. I wouldn't say it is. 
It's written by Peter J. Tomasi. That's why it was awesome. Art by Ian Bertram. I was so happy. Okay, so let's... Sorry. Rewind. We are in the future. Batman's turning 75. Mm -hmm. Old man Bruce. And they're having a big birthday party for him. So you got all the old... You have um, Tim and Dick and Barbara and old man Alfred still fucking alive. Yeah, that was so nice. He's like, here I am on my little wheelchair. Here's your tea. His oxygen mask. Yeah. I felt like sad, but happy that he was alive. I was so happy he was alive. I'm like, he's just pretending. (laughs) Now you take care of him, Bruce, because this is bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) Same with the Bat family. You guys take care of him, too. You were saying one of them didn't really look that old anymore. I think you were saying Robin, a.k.a. Nightwing. <laughs> yeah. He definitely had some plastic surgery and dyed his hair. Because <laughs> Tim looked way older. He had, like, gray streaks on the side. Mm-hmm. And Nightwing's just like, mm, so young. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite was when they blew out the candles. And they're all close helping <laughs> Bruce Wayne <laughs> blow out the candles. But... Damien in the back, like 10 feet away, blowing also. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even like, normally you blow out candles and you go, <sighs> Damien's like, <sighs> <laughs> not even really trying. Which is very Damien-like. It is. But I think the uh, what makes the story great is they all go out, the Bat family. They know what they have to do anytime, you know, the Bat signal goes up or there's crime. He has the Bat computer saying, hey, you guys, go over here. This bank is getting robbed. So they go out there. Turns out Bruce has actually been going out this entire time, feigning that he's retired, and you see the Batman work still at 75. It's very Dark Knight Returns type of storytelling with that portion of it. There's even a reference to the Dark Knight Returns, one of the splash pages from Frank Frank Miller's book is kind of recreated in this with old man Bruce. So I thought that was awesome, and then he gets back, and it's just so funny that Bruce Wayne still can kick ass and make it back before anyone else, Mm -hmm. because he's fucking Batman. Yeah, I think Barbara even said there were um, a record number of arrests that yeah. night because Bruce is like, watch out, mofos, show mm-hmm. you how it's done. Exactly. The next one is called Hero. It has story and art by Francesco Francavilla. This was my least favorite of the thing. Really? I take back if I said it about the Joker recreation, but this one, it's like Batman saves someone and then the boy says, thank you. And then that's it. Like, that's the whole story. I don't know if no, I missed the message here. It's Junior. James Gordon Jr.? Yeah. What difference does it make, though? I don't know. Because he's creepy. He tries to kill <laughs> Batgirl later. But it's okay, so he saves James Gordon Jr. Yeah. And then what? Just go take a nap, Dan, if you don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> I'm not going to bother explaining it to you, Dan. You you wouldn't get it. I don't think you get it either, Kelly. Listen, no, I get it. I just It's, don't... it's Junior, Dan. It's just Junior. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> like, the lady says, God bless Batman, and then the story's over. <laughs> I'm well. Like, Next one's called The Sacrifice. It's written by Mike Barr with art by Guillaume March, who uh, I love. This love one Guillaume was March. sad. It was drawn well. It's uh, Phantom Stranger shows up and he's like, okay, Batman, I'm going to take you back and let's pretend your parents live and let's see what happens. And he goes back in time and realizes that by sacrificing his parents, he saves other people. Like Nightwing becomes a crazy hoodlum. Right. Doesn't take care of himself. Yeah. Definitely not whiny, apparently. Yeah, the Phantom Stranger shows him that even though he went through some of the worst shit that anyone could go through, it's for the greater good because Gotham is much safer with the Batman than without. Mm -hmm. It kind of assumes that without a Batman, these criminals would have still been around, which the argument is interesting because it's like some of these villains maybe came about because Batman exists. Some of them possibly helped create the Batman as to seeing who he is today, but... That was touched upon in that Batman the Animated Series episode where they're in the courthouse and the, war, yeah. the Gotham's biggest critic who is against the Batman and she's a prosecutor. The Joker makes her the defense and you're going to defend Batman and you hate Batman. And she has to because otherwise they'll both be killed. And they kind of make the point of actually the criminals probably created Batman. Crime itself created Batman and it's not Batman that's creating the Jokers or the Scarecrows or anything. If there was no crime, if there weren't any of you perpetuating this crime, there never would have been a Batman in the first place. So it's not necessarily placing the blame on these villains, but the ones in all of Gotham and all of its history. Mm -hmm. This next one was probably my favorite. It's called Gothtopia. It's written by John Lehman with art by Jason Fabok. Yeah, this is the first chapter of Gothtopia. We were a little confused as to what Gothtopia was. 
but all our answers are given here. Mm-hmm. It's great. We open up with seeing Poison Ivy, and she's on the street, and she's just going crazy, and Batman and... It's Catwoman, but they call her Catbird. She's kind of like a Robin Catwoman Catwoman hybrid. They show up and they take her down. And in the middle of the day, which I thought was really cool, it's pretty much an alternate, a parallel Gotham. Right. Where everything is bright and sunny and everybody's happy and they have the lowest crime rate ever. Because pretty much when crime springs up, Batman just takes him down. Right. And with this Gothopia too, you notice that Batman's outfit is actually white instead of black. Mm -hmm. And... Later on in the story, he kind of realizes that something's not right because true Batman starts coming out. And not to spoil exactly what it is, but if you, again, going back to the animated series, because that's the point of reference that every (laughs) Batman anything should go back to is the animated series. It goes back to that episode with, not the Scarecrow, it was with Mad Hatter. Yeah, I think it was called Perchance for a Dream. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And it's it's exactly like that, where eventually Batman Batman's his way into reality and, you know, figures everything out. So that's kind of what Gothopia is, but with more people involved, not just Batman. And Batman and Catwoman are in love. That's probably how he discovers that this is uh, not no, a reality. No, are he's you? Like, no. You're Natalia. <laughs> Where's not what Damien? he says at all. I don't see Damien Damien's anywhere. dead, Dan. <laughs> he died. I won't accept that. <laughs> Final story is called 27. It's a story by Scott Snyder, art by Sean Murphy. This is a jump into the future throughout the generations, throughout the history of Gotham for Batman, showing that there will always be a Batman and what Batman's plan is for when he passes on. This is this was a a very Batman thing to do. He pretty much creates another one of himself. He figures he has X amount of years where he can function as Batman. So in that, in the last two years of that span of time, if there's still crime, then a new Batman will be activated yeah. and have to be trained as Batman to go and then carry on. I think it's at the age of 27, mm-hmm. which is w- would be his prime, I guess, for Batman at 27. And it's really funny because every time there's a new generation, the old generation of Batman, Bruce Wayne, that knows he's about to die because he's older, will know that what decision will happen and what will create the new Batman. And regardless of how much they try to escape, like, I'm not going to be Batman. I'm my own, even though I'm a clone, like, I'm going to go ahead and make my own decisions. And then the call of Gotham City comes and Batman being a clone of Batman will answer that call no matter what. It was really cool. That was a great story as well. It kind of reminded me of Samurai Jack a little bit, though, I guess, in the art style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit. I can see that. But this has uh, what some people are calling like incontinuity future. I don't necessarily see it that way. But you saw like the giant mech robot Batman in the future. The surfboard Batman. uh, Black Robin at one point. It's like I don't think any of this is continuity. It's it's a little too different and far-fetched. I don't think they'd ever take Batman in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think he'll always kind of stay in this future slash past mixed together type of world where it kind of fits no matter what period you're reading it in and that's i think how it should stay Mm -hmm. i agree i think it will stay that way but it was still a great story to read and kind of let your imagination run where it's what happened to get to this point to get to this batman that we're seeing now next one is called forever evil arkham war number four of six finally moving on from the detective comics (laughs) book this one's written by again peter j tomasi art by scott eaton and jaime mendoza I am not liking Arkham War. I'm just going to throw that out there. There's too much going on. Took a turn for you? Too many people being too many things and See, I was whiny. and still waiting for Scarecrow to come out full force, and we never got that. Like, they set up Scarecrow to be this big piece of this Arkham War that they're having, and he kind of is just another guy controlling another army. I thought that we were going to follow the Scarecrow. Really, we're just following Bane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bane being Bane Batman. Yeah. Which was cool when he put on the costume, and now I feel like he hasn't really done anything with it. Um, They're pretty much controlling the talons. That's all these villains are doing now. It's not about themselves. It's about, let's use these other villains to take down the people we're fighting against. Yeah, I was saying, I was telling you, like, if I was Scott Snyder, I'd be like, they're raping the hell out of my talons. (laughs) Like, they're just using them as this big device plot device in the story and it's like save the talents for later i want to see the talents return in some later batman story instead they're all over arkham war yeah strix okay fine she's running around somewhere else but this uh 
dynamic duo, as they call it on the cover of the book, between ba Bane and the Court of Owls member, the Talon, I kind of like that relationship between the two. It's kind of like a out-of-time Talon that sees the current trend that's going on in Gotham, and he says, this isn't how you control a city. I'm going to show you how, and that's why he teams up with Bane, because he knows that with Bane, they can control the city like the court used to back when he was alive. Yeah, I feel they're just throwing in too much of the Talons. The Talons are supposed to be in secret. So, okay, have that one that's chilling with Bane. That's cool. But all the rest of them, eh. One thing I did like that I wanted to point out that I don't feel that he stressed on enough was Bane is actually taking in regular city people and giving them food and water and shelter. And that's going to be interesting to see how they react when Batman does come back and the crime syndicate is taken down. Now these people have this image of Bane where he's a good guy. Right. And it helps that he is Batman. Mm -hmm. He's taking, you know, the persona of Batman because that's how people kind of better gravitate towards this villain. But it was good. Um, you know, it was all right. It wasn't my pass of the week, but, you know, we still got two issues left. So, yeah, we'll see. And our final DC comic of the week is The Movement number 8, written by Gail Simone, with art by Freddie Williams II. Yeah, this is the final story, the final piece of this first arc that Gail put together, and it's a strong finish. Mm-hmm. It was great. A lot of funny moments. Um, I'm beginning to like this one a little bit more. I think she's really hit her stride, and we're really understanding the characters and where they come from and their motivations. Who's your favorite? I really like the Rat King. Like oh, he creeps issue. me out. Gross. <laughs> I think I like Burden the best. Like okay, he's like, we kissed you. We're in love now. <laughs> <laughs> we kissed a girl. We're married. <laughs> I thought that was great. You said Burden? Mm-hmm. I really like Burden. Yeah. I think my favorite character is Catharsis. Um, but all of them have like some special trait to them that makes them likable and relatable. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, I, again, I've been liking the movement more than you have. And you've been liking Teen Trailing there some more than I have. And which one made it out? The one that I picked. So <laughs> Probably because DC would get more shit if something Gail Simone related got canceled. <laughs> probably. You treat women badly. Well, they, she can't sell the book. What, what do you mean she can't sell the book? Women can't sell books? Uh. <laughs> well, let's, let's cancel this man's book instead. No! <laughs> so it was good. I liked it. I can't wait to see Batgirl in the next issue. Mm -hmm. That's going to be so cool. We did get to see a hint of that. Of course she would be in it because Gail Simone is writing it. Well, I like Batgirl written by Gail Simone mm -hmm. and more Batgirl in another Gail Simone book is fine. Batgirl can show up in Red Sonja and I'd be happy. <laughs> That'd Wouldn't be make so sense, weird. It'd be cool. It'd make no yeah. sense. <laughs> but that will do it for comics this week and the rest of the podcast. I think we can go ahead and go with our pick of the week. I'm going to go with Detective Comics number 27. I'm going to pick that one as well. I felt like it, it it was a better compilation book than the Batman Black and White. It had some better stories in it. Gothopia is off to a great start. Mm -hmm. Do you have a pass of the week? Yes, I do. My pass of the week is going to be Forever Evil Arkham War number four. Mine will actually be uh, Batman Superman number seven. Oh no, but the gay Superman moments. Those are great too. But if you don't enjoy the Batman love Superman moments as much as we do, pass on it. Yeah. Well, that'll do it for our podcast this week. You guys can check us out at twitter.com, hashtag the reasons I'm broke. If you have a mobile device, go ahead and download Stitcher. You can also find us on stitcher.com, but if you download the app on Stitcher, search the reasons I'm broke, you can subscribe. It'll give you a notification for when a new episode is up. And for any computer or iDevice, we are also up on iTunes. Just search the reasons I'm broke, leave us a comment. It'll help other people find us. Also on YouTube, we put up the podcast on there as well, but also some unboxing videos for statues, all kinds of collector's editions, video game systems. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Our most recent unboxing was the Harley Quinn bombshell statue. Amazing. Definitely check it out. Great statue. I love it. And March 21st through the 23rd, make sure to show up at Megacon. We will be there all weekend. Megaconvention.com for your tickets. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm Daniel. And I'm Kelly. See you next week.